Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World City Summit 2022. Development track entitled, How Can Partnerships Transform the Development of Cities? I'm your host, Sean, from the Centre for Livable Cities. Let me invite you to take your seats as we will be starting the track in a few moments. During this event, we would like to remind audience members to kindly keep your mask on. Please also set your phones and beeping devices to silent mode. In accordance with the personal data protection policy, it is our duty to inform you that this session will be recorded. If you feel unwell at any time during the session, please approach anyone with an organizer's badge. During the session, we invite audience members to pose any questions you may have for our speakers using Slido. To do this, please scan the QR code shown on the screen. You can also vote for questions from other audience members that you like via the app. Some of these questions will be taken at the Q&A segment later. As mentioned, there is simultaneous interpretation for this session, so do remember to collect your receivers at the entrance of the hall. We also appreciate everyone's understanding should there be any time lag during translation. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the session. Please join me to welcome on stage our esteemed speakers and moderator for the development track. First, we have our moderator, Ms. Huang Yuning, Chief Planner of the Urban Redevelopment Authority, and our panel speakers. First, we have Mr. Tulsi Aluwihare, Deputy Managing Director, Port City, Colombo. Next, Mr. Thomas Kufen, Mayor of Essen. Ms. Amy Chester, Managing Director, Rebuild by Design. Mr. Val Van Horn, Vice Chairman, People's Committee, Ho Chi Minh City. And last but not least, Mr. Chintan Ravashir, City's Leader for Southeast Asia, Arab. As mentioned, anytime during the panel session, you may use the Slido QR function if you have any questions for our, uh, for our panelists later. Without further ado, I will now pass the floor on to our moderator, Yuning, to kick off the session with some opening remarks followed by a quick fire introduction with our panelists. Yuning, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this development track. And uh, let me just start off with a few opening comments. And if I could have the slides. Yeah, so cities are grappling with a lot of challenges. I think the challenges are increasingly complex, but there are also many opportunities. And with accelerating pace of change and increasing need for a more resilient, uh, sustainable and cohesive city, how can city planners and industry stakeholders and city leaders come together with the community, with the industry to find solutions and communicate and collaborate with each other? I think that's one of the challenges that we have for discussion today this is about partnership. And as city leaders, how do we forge meaningful and long-standing partnerships across all of society in order to build more resilient and livable cities for everyone? How do we harness what different partners could bring to the table, whether it's the community, the private sector, government institutes of higher learning, and how do we come together to build a resilient ecosystem? So how can we connect and collaborate to realize a shared vision? Now, I want to just bring you through quickly a couple examples from Singapore. Our planning process has stood as well in balancing different land use needs in Singapore. And at each stage, it's been a partnership, partnership with the community and a variety of other stakeholders. For the ongoing long-term plan review, which is now on exhibition at the URA Center. This is a plan for the next 50 years and beyond. And we see a need to make provision for more flexibility and resilience and inclusiveness. 
So instead of focusing on a singular possible future, we cater for a range of possible futures while standing guided by a shared vision for Singapore. And how do we arrive at that shared vision? We carried out and reached out to over 15,000 people to discuss and identify what are our common aspirations for Singapore, their concerns and hopes and dreams for Singapore. And these insights helped us shape the long-term plans and strategies that you can view at the exhibition. We are also learning from many of you how business improvement districts can help bring precinct stakeholders together to take greater ownership in shaping their precincts. We have started with a pilot uh, business improvement district or BID program and are seeing positive reception and outcomes, even through the COVID challenges. For instance, the member of one pilot business improvement district, uh, Tanjong Paga, which is on, on your left, uh, came together to transform a piece of vacant land in the CBD into a thriving community green with an eco playground that's suitable for all ages both the young and the seniors to meet. And uh, with the safe distancing practices in place, another pilot bit, the Raffles Place in the middle of the screen, brought in the work of students, design students, to transform social distancing space requirements into positive spaces for art. So there are also a variety of other initiatives as can be found in many of your cities and communities. As we tackle the unprecedented disruption due to COVID-19, new forms of partnerships in Singapore, such as Alliance for Action, have also emerged to bring together the people, private and public sectors to co-create and implement solutions to, challenge important, uh, to challenges important to Singapore. And these action for Alli Alliance for Action tackle a wide range of issues, including improving social, support enhancing mental well-being, as well as enhancing digital access, improving job access, etc. So by now, about 34,000 people and 1,500 organizations have been involved and collaborated with government agencies over 150 projects through uh, 31 Alliance for Action since June 2020. So it's been a good model of another form of partnership that we see in Singapore. So I look forward to hearing from our panel members and their thoughts on how can partnerships transform the development of cities. And to just warm us up and introduce our panel members to the audience, I now want to do a rapid fire round with all the panelists as a warm up exercise. So just very quickly tell us your name and give us a one line answer to this question. The COVID-19 period has brought complex challenges, but also new opportunities for our cities. Name one key partnership that you're focusing on for your city or your firm. Maybe we can start with uh, Mr. Tulsi. Hi, um, Tulsi, Tulsi Alivihare from uh, Colombo Port City. I think I bring a different perspective for this panel because all my panelists are from existing cities decision makers, whereas we are really building a, a new city within a city of Colombo. Uh, so I guess whilst COVID-19 pandemic most definitely impacted uh, Colombo and our city, what I can tell you is that in terms of developing a new city, we have taken into some of the urban uh, development principles in our master plan city, which I will explain a little bit later when, when uh, during my uh, during my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Tosi. Your Excellency, Mayor Coffin. My name is Thomas Kufen. I'm the Lord Mayor of Essen, and um, thank you for the invitation and the, um, for the question. I think um, the COVID-19 um, was a top issue during the last two years and we learned a lot about the virus and we learned a lot about communication, communication with the people. The virus is not only a virus, it's, um, it's in, in the mind. We have to change the mindset. And so um, 
we lesson, one lesson that we learned in the communication is keep it simple and keep it clear so you reach the people. Thank you, Mayor. And let's move on to Amy. Go ahead, Amy. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. So I am the director of Rebuild by Design, which is, um, is located in New York City and works with communities and local governments, both locally, nationally, and internationally, um, almost exclusively through a partnership uh, process. One of the exciting partnerships that is happening in my hometown in New York State is that we had been working with the governor of New York State for the past three years to talk about the communities that have already been suffering because of climate change. And because of our research and our partnership, there is a $4.2 billion question on the ballot in November of this year for voters to vote for ecological and um, climate resilience, which we're very excited about. Thank you, Amy. And Your Excellency, Vice Chairman, Mr. Vaughn. I am Von Van Horn, the Vice Chairman of Ho Chi Minh City's People's Committee. Just like everyone present here, we are all living in a city. Some cities have already developed remarkably, and some cities are still developing. However, regardless of the level of development, these cities are facing the same type of challenges. COVID-19 is a pandemic, which makes these challenges more apparent, but it has brought us closer together in order to solve the common problems that I would like to share. I will be touching on the partnership between the open areas and the future development together with all of you. Thank you, Vice Chairman. And Chin Tan, what's one of the key partnerships you're looking at? Uh, thanks, Yuning. Um, hi, I'm Chintan Ravesh here, and I lead the city's business for Arup, a multidisciplinary design firm, uh, and I'm based in Singapore. Uh, so yes, uh, while it's Mr. Tulsa, you said that I'm based in Singapore, but a lot of our work is designing and planning new cities as well as looking at changes in existing cities. So I think we probably will share some thoughts on that one. Uh, but what's one key in terms of partnership? I would say partnership in addressing equity. I think that's probably the biggest thing that we're looking at right now. Um, equal access to health and resource has probably become a big important thing, including food and water, or, or uh, equity in terms of even economics. I mean, yet, before this, we were in a panel where we were talking to developers, and uh, the, the economics of a city is an important bit. And finally, the equal access for people and planet. I think that's going to be a very, very important thing for the future. So equity for people, planet, and economics, and all of that come together. Thank you, Chin Chan. Well, let's go on to hear from each panelist to give us a little bit more details about what their thoughts are on this topic. So, see, take us away, please. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so as I mentioned, we are building a new city within a city. In Sri Lanka, those who you are not familiar with where Colombo is, this is uh, what you see on the slides. We are on the tip of the Indian India, smack on the middle of the Indian Ocean. This is uh, one of the busiest uh, sea lanes connecting East Asia, Far East, and the Persian Gulf, and connecting East Africa. As you can see, in terms of the, the location, we are quite strategically located, not only on the, the way about eight nautical miles from one of the busiest sea lanes. So what we have done is we have anchored this new Colombo port city. It's called Development to Core, an extension of the existing Colombo CBD. The north part is bordering our port of Colombo with a 5.2 kilometer breakwater and we have anchored this 2.7 square kilometer city to the existing port of Colombo. So this is the master plan. 
what you can see is the, uh, the carefully thought through master plan with 74 marketable plots. Depending on where you are as a country on the development life cycle, your priorities will differ. In the last two days, I've heard many talking about decarbonization, inclusiveness, uh, technology. Whilst these are quite important uh, and priority for us, there is a division, divide between a first world as against a developing country. So with the implementation or establishment of the Colombo port city, our aspiration is not only to address rapidly urbanizing population issues around it, but also to address some other socio-economic issues that we are faced with. Youth unemployment, brain drain is a key issue for us. With creating Port City, what we or the objective of creating Port City is to really create a destination appeal for diverse international community to come and live, work and invest here. So we are looking for multinational companies to come and set up in Port City. And the partnership here with the government of Sri Lanka is that the private sector had made the investment because due to lack of fiscal space of the government, with the investment of $1.4 billion, we have reclaimed land from the sea, invested in all internal utility infrastructure that is required, connected, connecting all 74 marketable plots. And the government of Sri Lanka is required to augment this infrastructure investment, or let me call it the hardware, by the software that is required, which is the business-friendly laws, regulations, and also addressing some of the inherent issues we have within Sri Lanka or within Colombo in attracting investment. So the partnership, it's like any other public-private partnership. This is the largest public-private partnership. And we have carefully allocated the risks and rewards between the government and the project company within the private sector. And to quickly brief you where the project is at the moment, we have completed reclamation of 269 hectares of the 2.7 square kilometer city. There is a special economic zone law which was enacted last year, which is, administer, which is administering and governing this, this city. And as we speak now, we are open for investment and close to 100 hectares of land is ready for investments and all investors or developers are required to adhere to this Port City master plan. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. So PPP is a special form of partnership between the government and the private sector. And I, I guess the uh, challenge would be to then also attract external investments further beyond the PPP partnership and also as an opportunity to test bait some of the ideas and potentially drive some of the possible social and economic outcomes that could extend beyond Port City and support other places uh, as a model outside Port City. So thanks so much for that sharing. Mayor Coffin, we turn to you now. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here to discuss on the international level those matters which concern us and are close to our hearts, the resilience of our hometowns. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start briefly introducing the city of Essen to you. Thanks to its great economic power, the city of Essen is one of the most important business locations in Germany. Due to its central location and with the performance-oriented thinking 
the city of Essen is the heart of a region characterized but only by this ability to transform, but also by <clears throat> major structural challenges. We call the transformation from green to gray to green. Before industrialization, the city of Essen was a small green agriculture town with an ancient ministry. With the start of the mining of coal and the production of coke and steel, Essen became one of the most important centuries of these products in Germany and in Europe. However, the city suffers from the consequences of these industrial development with air, water, soil pollution. For this reason, we call this the phase of gray period. With the end of the coal mining, structural change has seen as an opportunity for transformation. And in 2007, we were granted the title European Green Capital, thus providing that we had succeed in the change from green to gray to green back. As the Green Capital of Europe 2017, when in Essen have been able to show people all over the world the power of structural change can unleash. Change has provided an energy for our local economy and helped to shape the city into a place where people like to live and to work. Our next green step is now to develop of hydrogen systems. As the energy, cap energy capital of Europe, Essen, and thus come home to leading companies and research institutes that continued a complete hydrogen ecosystem. For a year now, the city of Essen has been bringing this protagonists together in a H2 advisory board under my leadership. With the aim of the combining forces at the highest level, developing projects together and actively implementing them. Hydrogen is a fuel for climate protection and sustainability. Our goal is to be one of the top locations for hydrogen products and transformation technology in the coming decades. We take our challenges for our century seriously. We are committed to our city, our country, our citizens, and the future of our children. We want to fulfill our commitment to a healthy urban society. Thank you very much for your invitation and stay healthy. Thank you, Mayor Coffin. I like your point that we need strong partners to really look at addressing and uh, involving and including citizens in the environmental protection. And that partnership is very crucial in order to see success of some of the projects that you're looking at. So thank you for those comments. Uh, Amy, we turn to you now. Thank you so much. So I'm going to talk about a recent project that we did with the city, um, with the county of Boulder in Boulder, Colorado in the United States. And Boulder, Colorado, like many governments, understood during COVID that not all of its citizenry experienced COVID in the same way. Some people um, were hurt much more than other people. Some people had a much harder time. So they wanted to do things a little bit differently and figure out exactly who was hurt and how those people can be part of the decision-making process going forward. So they reached out to Rebuild by Design, and while we usually work on climate, um, this is very, a very similar process that we wanted to work on with Boulder, Colorado, to raise the bar in how governments respond. So the, the government put the, all of the $60 million that were given by the federal government on the line, and we work with them to identify key NGO partners that could help us throughout the whole process. This is something that Rebuild by Design always begins with, is thinking about who do we want to partner with. So we brought in six partners that represented the disability community, community the Latino Business um, Chamber of Commerce, and other partnerships that um, we knew had the tentacles within the community. And together, we created an outreach plan. We only had six weeks in order to do outreach, 
and we planned it together. And what we decided to do, since it was still locked down, was to create a survey that could be administered either on the phone or actually in person, sitting around tables like, like you're all right now or in Zoom. So we worked with our six organizations and we used all of the county's resources and um, reached out to as many people as we possibly could to really understand who has been most affected and how they've been most affected and to hear their ideas of how we can build back better using the government dollars that were available. And in six weeks, we were able to collect over um, 1,500 surveys, working with 331 community organizations through 40, more than 40 events. And for the second phase of the project, we wanted to take what we learned in the first phase, which was um, that the communities are um, most in need of economic opportunities, affordable housing, and mental health services and social resilience. So we planned three working groups on those subjects. And the innovation that we did here was to have one of the NGO leaders that we worked with through the first phase to co-lead the process with an agency head through the second phase. So that community and government would have to be working directly together to create the working group process, select the members, and then ultimately, ultimately make the recommendations to the government board who would allocate the funds. So we created these three working groups and everything was done online. And we appointed 75 people to the working groups, which the agency had co-led. And through another six week process, they worked very tire tirelessly to think about what are the specific ways that we can address these three issues. In the end, each of the working groups presented their findings and made recommendations for the dollar amount, um, about $20 million they were given per working group. And I'm very pleased to say that about 85% of that money has been allocated already and the community, um, the government of Boulder has decided to follow the working group's recommendations. What's most, real, what's most exciting really is that we have raised the level of community collaboration with the government. And now the government's gonna be held to a higher standard next time that there are opportunities like this by those same working group members. Thank you, Amy. And I, I thought it's very remarkable that as coming from the outside, you thought of teaming up with uh, key partners who had already tentacles in the community so that you're immediately plugged in to who to reach out to, who are the affected people to speak with, and thereby raising the whole level of engagement and partnership within the community. And even when, when your organization leaves the scene, so to speak, you've left as a legacy that whole process of a deeper collaboration and raising that whole standard of community involvement. So that's fantastic. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Mr. Vo, I'd like to move on to you to hear from your experience um, from Ho Chi Minh City, please. Thank you. Yeah. Xin cảm ơn bà. Thì chắc uh, tất cả chúng ta ngồi trong sáng phòng này đều uh, nhận thức rằng Thank you very much. I think all of us in this room are aware that cities are the heart where many people live in. Cities are the center of non-agricultural activities, social, economic, and education activities. I think the relationship among our communities and citizens are multi-sided. Based on the law, rules, and disciplines, a city that wants to have sustainable development needs three factors a strong governance slash government, a strict sense of guidelines, and a community that has a high level of self-discipline. From the past until now, we have had misconceptions that we don't see the partnership between government and communities as an important role, and that we always see this relationship as dependent. That's why the policies that we plan out for them 
are not suitable to them and are not accepted by our citizens. Another area that is also important is that cities in our world with different levels of development need to cooperate more to develop together. Especially in bringing along those that are still looking for development direction. In Ho Chi Minh City, we've been organizing a lot of activities and events, especially with Singapore. We signed the memorandum to formulate and plan out the city. We also cooperate with the government in Germany to draw from their expertise for our mega city projects. Japanese cities for urbanization development as well as cities in France for urban management. We have a lot of projects on the way for development in the city. We see that the effective development of the city needs cooperation. And we must regularly exchange expertise to maintain and control the development of Asian cities and promote cooperation between the cities. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Uh, I thought your perspective of the city-to-city -city partnership is a really important perspective, that there's opportunity there for collaboration, for institutional capacity building and exchange. And platforms like the World City Summit are a great way for us to build that kind of relationship across cities. So thank you for that view. Uh, Chin Tan, over to you, please. Thank you. I think there's a benefit of being the last one because you hear so much from you all that I can almost dramatically change what I want to talk about. <laughs> because I have two mayors who come top down and, and Amy, you come bottom up. And then we're talking about a brand new city to be built for people. Um, so I, I want to talk about three things and probably it'll connect with all four of you in a way. Uh, and the three things is rebalancing our cities. The second is uh, competitiveness of our cities. And the third is trust and, believe it or not, love. Um, and I'm an urban design architect, so you can see where the love part, the emotion is coming from the city. So city, and I talked about it a bit yesterday at the Mayor's Forum as well, that cities are a cause, but also a solution for us to get to our regenerative future that we're talking about uh, because of the density that we live in. Um, and we play, we, when I say we, I think cities, and I think more, almost everyone in this room have some way of connecting and doing something in our cities, uh, have an exceptional role to play in this post-COVID world, or should I say post-COVID market. Um, so rebalancing of cities, what does that mean? It's because cities play a dual role, right? The first one is about being international, being attractive for the, to the foreign talent, people coming and living. And Mr. Tulsi spoke about that, about how he wants to get those people in every other city is talking about that. But at the same time, you've got to play a very emotional role about how, at the very same moment, about how people who are your citizens, they respect your city, they feel owned, they own the city, and they love the city that they live in. So how do you play the duality? Every city goes through that thing about being international and being local at the same time. 
So that rebalancing is an interesting one that we all have to constantly keep in mind of. Uh, because also about attracting and being competitive, but also equitable for its own citizens. Because you, if you create that ownership, sense of ownership for the citizens, it automatically makes the city more attractive. So it's kind of a dual role there. And at the same time, you all have to play the role of helping our citizens move towards a decarbonized lifestyle. And that's a bottom-up thing as well. Of how do you work with that duality? So that's rebalancing of our cities. The other one is a competitiveness, which is an interesting one. Um, we as, uh, in Arab, we did a competitive, of, com competitive, nice, competitive uh, index for cities. And we could only do 200 cities. And I know there are more than 10,000 cities in the world. Uh, but we did 200 cities and bit of data we had. And what came out was very interesting. There's a direct correlation of city competitiveness to the greenhouse gas emissions. Which means, in other words, the more competitive your city is, the more greenhouse gas it emits which means we need to really de-link that for the future generation and for this planet, this aspect of we wanting to be competitive, but not, re uh, not releasing the gas in the world. So that aspect of competitiveness, we need to really, really think about. And for that, we need to have a top-down and bottom-up approach in both ways, and hence it connects to all four of you. We need to have clear le leadership, city leaders coming and putting clear policies in place for that, for that aspect to happen. But at the same time, you need to take the implementers with you on the journey. Implementers like Rebuild by Design or, or consultants like us, or for that matter, financiers in the city or the developers, et cetera, who we were talking to earlier, who can implement your laws in the city. So do not forget those. And you need to work that together, top down and bottom up. I mean, various examples that I could say, um, we did the green economy uh, plan, for, sorry, not, uh, the green economy plan for the prime minister's office in Singapore. And that was an absolute hand-in-glove partnership with the government of Singapore to make that happen. From there, talking about planning, which is where I led the job of leading, uh, developing the plan for the Nusantara, the new capital city of Indonesia, which is 2019, pre-COVID, which is very interesting to think about what that could be, which is five times the size of Singapore. We had to think about that. And going down and engaging with the residents of Kalimantan, which is where the city is going to come. So that, that was part. And down to food, which is probably the biggest worry for everyone out here in this room of the food security part, which we've been developing the methodology and think, talking to startups, producers, distributors, academia, and that partnership think about comprehensively what food means for our cities. Um, and that's the part. And the, finally, the trust and love part. Uh, we have in deep partnerships with organizations like C40 or the Resilient Cities Network. And one thing we learned together was that they can only get success if you're able to bring trust in the relationship with the citizens, and more importantly, the love part of it. If you can't bring that in the citizens, you will not be able to get anywhere with that. So to conclude in this part, I would say rebalancing of people and nature, hence the behavioral change aspect, uh, rebalancing of people and our governments, the trust part of it, and rebalancing of people and our cities, the built environment, so the love part of it. And finally, the overall thing, which uh, you mentioned that, Vice Chairman, very, very clearly, is partnerships between cities, which is knowledge sharing. That's super important. These platforms allow us to do that, and that's brilliant. And that's why I'll end it. Thank you, Chintan. Fantastic. <laughs> you earn applause from me, Kaufman. Yeah, we want to now turn to the whole panel, and let's talk about what do we see as the key ingredients to success to form enduring partnerships. Because I think many of us, and we've heard from the comments, that partnerships are not once-off. They need to be a continuous process of uh, building these partnerships, as well as um, making sure that these partnerships continue to be effective, building that trust and that love for the city. So uh, who would like to take us off on this topic and share your thoughts? And what do you think are the key ingredients to ensuring success in the partnership? I, I can jump in. Oh, go ahead, Mayor. Uh, maybe <laughs> Amy first, and uh, then we turn to Mayor Coffin. You know, when I think about partnerships, for us, our experience is how do we get government to want to create partnerships with community? And, of course, get community to start trusting government. And what we find works really well is creating shared goals together, understanding what each other is coming from and actually putting it down on paper 
and using that as the North Star to work together. But one thing that I always hear when I meet government for the first time is they say, oh, well, what if we don't like what the community wants? And we hear this all the time. And then I just tell them, well, then we can't do it. You have to have the trust that we're going to be able to build this based on your shared goals, that it's going to be something that you're going to want to implement too. And if you don't, we shouldn't even start because what they're really looking for then is only one side of the partnership, but not the other. Thank you. Tamea? I think um, with any partnership, it requires trust and reliability and the virus partners. For challenges and measures that go behind the city lights, limits, we also need the support of the federal government, which has our backs and financial support, especially with international partners. But also, it's very important, um, some very few words, listen, understand, and do it. That describes the task, what we have to share as a city leader. Listen, understand, and do it. At the state level, you can, um, at international level, you can discuss problems. As a mayor, you have to solve problems every day and every day. That's the difference between other levels and the local level. Thank you, May. Any other thoughts on this? Yep, I can, I can add mine. So, as I mentioned, uh, when you are partnering, especially with a government, to build a new city and stakes are high in terms of the investment, in this case, Port City, obviously the infrastructure to create the land and the, and the utility requirement is as high as about one and a half billion dollars. And the further development capital that we are looking at is about further $15 billion to, for, for private sector to come and build. So how do you, at the, at the onset, how do you align the requirements and objectives of the government and the private sector? What are the issues? Because the issues that the government is trying to resolve may not necessarily be the issues that we are trying to resolve as a private sector. So we really need to strike that balance at the onset and meet expectations of the both parties to ensure that the, the risks and rewards reflect the efforts. Because if you don't do that, and, 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 and I must say that as we go along this partnership, because let's assume a new city development, we are here for the long haul. At the best, we expect it will take about 20, 25 years. So a partnership with the government, 20, 25 years. We require capacity building. Institutions within government needs to be strengthened. And how can private sector help? More importantly, a city is just not a, a brick and mortar. What, what makes a city successful, vibrant, and you spoke about trust and love, is the people who live in there. How do you, how do you up the, the social standards of people who live there? The economic standards, economic requirements, can we create the, the, the socio-economic benefits that some of the other cities can do, and can we partner with some of these cities to, to address those issues? So trust is one, as we move with the government or the institutions as a partnership, rebalancing that and be dynamic and agile to the changing environment. When we invested in Port City, COVID was never there. And as you know, some of the economic challenges we are facing as a country was never there. So we need to relook at our master plan, relook at our objectives and realign as required. Thank you. Thank you, Tulsi. Uh, I think the audience, many of us are, uh, in a way, practitioners, you know, either mayors, officials running the city, or professionals uh, looking at the city and city issues. So that on this 
particular point about building trust, and this question is coming from the audience as well, uh, people are asking for practical advice on how do we go about building trust. I think many people recognize building trust is important, but are there practical suggestions or toolkits or something to help build that trust? Any thoughts on that, panel? Chintan, if I could turn to you. Yeah, it's a tricky one because, uh, uh, and this is purely experience because uh, our work, uh, we work across and globally in planning or designing existing or future cities. And we, the last thing we ever want, and in all the projects we do, the important thing is about working with various stakeholders and not just stakeholders across the city actors or city players, but also partners. We always work with partners who we take along with us, or they take us on the journey, who are basically locally based. Um, the trust is important because the stakeholders that we work with, we want them to realize that we come not as outsiders, but more as trying to understand what you locally want. And the local partnerships become really, really important. And that change from, and those partnerships change from culture to culture to culture. The, the time it takes to build that trust in Asia or Southeast Asia is very different than the time it takes to build that trust in, in, in let's say, where I was before, in London or, or even in Australia. Uh, uh, sometimes you feel the relationship in other parts of the world is more transactional and here is a lot more about building that level of uh, proximity and trust to, to go ahead. And that is important because you, that's leading to the point that re they recognize where you're coming from and you recognize where they're coming from. One of the biggest things we've learned is that cities have a mix of one thing is about doing a physical response of a master plan or doing something from top down. And the other thing is helping the governments or organizations realize there's an organizational change that you need as well. And that is normally a very difficult message to tell your government or any other government to say, you know what, you have an organizational problem. And if you want this city to be successful, you've got to change your organization. And that is only possible if you go bottom up in developing that trust and that bond that we are here to help you to, su to be successful. And that's where I would talk about the trust. So sounds like it's a journey. And I think Amy also earlier on offered that there could be trusted intermediaries that we can work with to deal with this. Maybe at this point, let's move on to the topic of leadership, which is another question that's coming in. What role can the city leadership play in building strong partnerships to advance the city's agenda? And uh, when it comes to leadership, I think we'll ask Mayor Coffin first, and then we'll move to Vice Chairman Mr. Vaughan to talk about leadership and how do we uh, use leadership in building strong partnerships. Thank you for the question. I think um, leadership changed during the last periods. For me, leadership therefore means the ability to set a direction and to convince others of this idea. That is why a network of partners is so important. If a city leader succeeds in bringing important partners together, it is easier to pursue companies, individuals, or states that have not prohibitionists being part of the network to join. So um, leadership starts with to be a leader, to be a fair leader, to be a um, compassionate leader. I think this is the first step. Thank you, Mayor Coffin. And Mr. Vaughan, I'd like to, you to talk about the role of leadership and how do you think leadership can help us uh, play a role in developing strong partnerships in the city? In my opinion, the most important ingredient is for developed cities to share and progress together. Like what Mayor Kufan said, we must listen to communities and citizens. Uh, 
but we also need to exchange experience among cities. Cities already developed can share their expertise to the slower cities to reduce cost of development. And governments and enterprises should share among themselves too. The city government should see enterprises as a partner, like a consumer of the products for the largest enterprises in society. So the city government needs to share their views with enterprises, listen to them and adjust their policies to become more suitable to enterprises in society and experience sharing among city leadership and communities. If we do this well, we will soon promote and improve our sustainable development. Thank you, Vice Chairman. And from uh, both city leaders, we are hearing that, you know, the city leadership really needs to come together and convene and bring the right stakeholders together to share and exchange and to hear each other because communication is so critical in building partnerships and ensuring that different perspectives are heard and that the policies uh, can be adjusted along the way um, in, in taking in the different views. Now, Chintan, just now your thoughts about uh, internalized rebalancing, international versus local sentiments that provoke some interest from the audience. And here's a question that's for Chintan, but I also like Amy to weigh in on this as well. Uh, so the question is, Chintan, how to balance emotions of local with globalization? Because locals usually feel new residents are fighting for opportunities, and sometimes it's difficult to balance both. Thank you for that difficult question, whoever gave me that. Because it is a difficult one, and it's a... It's, it's, it's a Must it's be a, your friend. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a learning one for everyone. What's, uh, just a small anecdote on this one. Uh, I was talking, I was in um, a, a young leaders conversation, uh, um, students of 25 year olds, like a week back in another conference. And we were talking about something like this. And one of the 24 year olds asked me the question, what's the cost of change? Incredibly <laughs> important question. You're like, okay, if the future of ours is in the hand of these 24 year olds, I think we're in a good shape if they're questioning cost of change. And they came from this very point of view that if we can't carry, if we focus on this massive change of decarbonization and create new skills, new jobs, upskilling, but if we can't take everyone on that journey with us, and if we do a lot of change and if, we, if there's a lot of people left behind, and yes, in the mayor's forum, a few people talked about that, that cost of chain becomes a big question for the person who's left behind. Because what is in it for me, and if, if I, I have changed so much, and if my life is still the same as what it was before, in fact, more painful, or I have lost my job, then I'm nowhere. And that is constantly a conversation between the internationalization and the localization of the identity question that keeps going on. And I think, and I'm gonna raise another point out here, which may create more questions out here, but I think, it is, it's an interesting one. Singapore is a city state and the conversation is how different it is for a city in a state. For example, London or Ho Chi Minh or New York for that matter and a city state. Because city in a state probably, and this is my just a thought out here right now, uh, it has more flex in terms of managing that aspect of being city being international and whereas the national, the local identity is managed through across the state. Whereas cities like Singapore need to constantly think about that because it lives in a city at the same time. And that balance is super important uh, of how we manage that, of how we do not leave people back when we are constantly changing as we go through the process. And I don't know if I answered that question, but I'm leaving probably more questions in people's mind. 
<laughs> I think that's the benefit of such panels, right? You provoke certain thoughts. Amy, I, I, please. Yeah, I think those are some really wise words. And I think we can also look at some of the global cities that you mentioned, whether it's New York or London, of how you can be both a global city and a local city. I grew up in New York City. I grew up in Brooklyn. It is very much a local city to me. It is a city that has changed um, tremendously over my life. And that excites the people who live there. It's usually the people who have come and moved there that don't want to see any change. You know, they've come and they say, oh, that's it. We want to freeze it in time. And it's the people that are you know, really on the grassroots of these uh, global cities that understand that part of what makes our city amazing is that we're completely re reinventing ourselves over and over again. And I think that the leadership piece of this is really um, essential here, where leaders have to know what their communities need and aren't willing to budge on what the communities need. And then after they're able to deliver that, they can be really creative and flexible about how they can be more global. Thank you very much, Amy. Those are very useful perspectives. I'm going to combine uh, some of the questions here and ask the panel everyone to comment on what is the most memorable or innovative partnership initiative that you've been part of to share a little bit about that uh Lucy, are we able to start with you on this one most innovative or memorable partnership that you've been part of yeah i guess answer is quite straightforward thank you um yeah it's uh, development of a, a new city let me tell you why is it innovative uh, because we are not trying to really if you look at a city typically you're trying to address uh, a, a rapid urbanization issues or cities grapple with age infrastructure but here whilst those are some of the objectives that we plan to achieve we are also trying to address a more economic and socio-economic issues you know how do we really uh, drive economic growth by creating a, a model city and urban development through special economic zone is not so unique but quite unique for south asia i would say and the primary objective is to really create a vibrant business district which will then transform into a, a more livable city thank you thank you amaya coffin could we have your thoughts on what is the most memorable or innovative partnership that you've been part of i think um the most important is um, you can do what you want, but it doesn't work against the people. You have to deal it with the people. You have to reach the people, the mind and the heart. And um, life is changing. And um, a city is never fixed. So um, to, to, to reach the heart and the mind of the people for, for the change process. This is very important. And authentic communication is the key for city leader, for the municipality, for the politics, and, and bring the people together and talk about not only why, talk about how. This is very important. Excellent point. Thank you. Amy? Um, I'll share the story of how Rebuild by Design actually came about, which is a very unique partnership. Hurricane Sandy hit uh, the United States now nine and a half years ago. It actually will be the 10th anniversary this October. And it was a, quite a devastating storm. We had 650,000 homes were damaged or destroyed, about $60 billion worth of damages, 8 million people without power, and it was a big wake-up call for our government. And what the, our federal government did, and this is under President Obama, is create an initiative that would set aside a billion dollars of the disaster recovery funds that should go to New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, which were the communities that were hit worse in the storm. 
and created a process which was called Rebuild by Design. And it called for um, government, sorry, it called for uh, experts from around the world to come to the region and actually work with the communities on the ground and local governments on the ground. And it said, if you develop projects that we're all in favor of, we will award you these dollars to have them built. So we created a very intensive process. It lasted about um, nine months through a research and design process and worked with over 500 community organizations and 181 government agencies. It's really enormous process. And at the end, the government awarded $930 million to seven of those projects. Well, now fast forward eight years later, and those projects have about $3.6 billion in them, and they're all breaking ground, which is enormously exciting. And then we took that process, and it's a process that we've now been able to apply on many different scales around the world in about a dozen different cities, and really thinking about how does that private sector expertise work with the local governments and communities to really share in the aspirations and create something that's implementable. Thank you, Amy. So that really provided an opportunity to innovate the process and taking that process and applying it to different contexts like Boulder, Colorado. Yep. Um, Vice Chairman Vaughn, if you have any thoughts to share on the most innovative or memorable partnership that you've been involved with. There is a saying that goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go to the end point, we go together. We want to indicate that in the past, the partnership amongst different cities were important. These have become more important and essential, especially now after the COVID-19 pandemic. That's why we wish to expand what we are doing now to coordinate and share expertise with partners, especially in big cities and events like this in Singapore. It has been very meaningful for us in the past few years in terms of city leadership. The most important issues require a mobilization of resources, such as manpower and finance, which face high demand but are yet limited. Any city will also have their own limited resources, but it is most important to note that the resources amongst our citizens, communities and private sector are unlimited. We can invest first in them, then get benefits for our projects. That's the reason why we try to mobilize these groups and resources. But as you know, the private sector in Ho Chi Minh City is not so big. Some of them focus their expertise in certain areas only. That's why we wish to partner with international cities to mobilize international and local resources in Ho Chi Minh City. We are very happy to meet all of you here with the presence of major cities. Thank you, Vice Chairman. And indeed, mobilizing uh, local resources, international resources, as well as capacity building is so important in developing partnerships. Chintan, your thoughts on innovative or memorable partnership? Uh, uh, this is again very helpful when you're the last one because you have so much time to think. Uh, I think, I'll, uh, and, I, and I thought it took me back close to 12 years or more uh, 
And this was in 2010 or 20, 2009, when resilience was not a word that was used in the market. And we developed the City Resilience Index for, for Rockefeller Foundation years ago. And we were then thinking, what includes in City Resilience? And there was a very strong partnership with Rockefeller Foundation where we looked at, and all the aspects that we spoke about today, uh, it was divided into four quadrants, leadership, economics, le so city leadership, economics, people, and infrastructure. Um, and we toyed around with the idea about what resilience means to begin with and what are the parameters that cities can be measured by in terms of resilience. And then making that tool and then eventually using that tool in various cities in the world. I mean, that partnership and that common language and that common issues that cities have spoken about through this just initiation of this tool and talking about resilience, I, I, it's been really overwhelming, but also heartening to see where we've led to at that point. So I think that's probably my take. Thank you so much, Chintan. Thanks for that sharing. And maybe we can take one last question, I think, from the audience. And here I have one that's kind of directed to uh, Thulsi and Vice Chair, uh, Mr. Vaughan, about how do you manage the interest and influence from partners, uh, whether it's geopolitical partners uh, like China, US, or even I think Mayor Coffin, your local politics, how do we manage that in a project? when dealing with different interests. Um, anybody would like to start? Lucy, yeah, thank you. Uh, definitely a difficult question. <laughs> Here, obviously, the private sector being uh, China, Sri Lanka here, coming together, uh, uh, building a new city. And some of these, and as I mentioned before, it's a long-term project, the best case, 20, 25 years, global dynamics change. Uh, and it is, I can tell you that it is just beyond building uh, or it is just beyond a real estate play. Uh, no doubt, uh, some of these decisions are driven by geopolitical anxieties. I guess that's where the, I guess we spoke about leadership before. The leadership will play a very key role. And continuation is a must. Because we also, my fellow panelists mentioned about leadership and trust. So trust is you, how do you build relationship and how do you ensure when you have a long-term project that the, the heads will change in the government heads will change in the private sector. How do you kind of ensure continue, continuation? Uh, that's why some of the uh, institutions, the capacity building uh, or the strengthening some of these institutions are key so that the relationships are, are, are continued. And um, yeah, and sometimes the needs of a particular country may be completely lopsided by the political needs, political requirements, geopolitical requirements of a, another country. So obviously, how do you align yourself to meet the objectives? Finally, what you are trying to do is trying to cater for the needs of your own citizens. And if you can get that right balance, obviously, you have achieved what you ultimately want to, to, to achieve. So Tulsi, sounds like a challenge negotiating and balancing the different needs. Um, Vice Chair, Mr. Bong, whether you have some comments on how do leaders, in a way, try to balance and negotiate this, you know, geopolitical or local politics in partnerships? I think that each country has its own political thinking. We may be in the same blocks, but still have different points of view, which might affect the relationship with corporations in other areas, such as investment trading and economics. But looking back seriously, all the countries depend on each other to develop. So there are competitiveness and challenges, but we depend on each other to make full use of each other's advantages and resources to develop.
vào nhau để phát triển For Ho Chi Minh City, our point of view is that all the partnerships to economically develop and promote trading of imports and exports have an important meaning to our development. Most importantly, here, we don't interfere in political areas of leadership. That's why we shall live in the diversity in terms of thinking, development requirement of each country, and the way each country leads. From there, we can learn from each other's mistakes and experiences. Chia sẻ lẫn nhau và xây dựng cho mình một con đường phát triển riêng trong sự phát triển đa dạng đó. Xin Thank you so much, Vice Chairman. And looking for those common interests is so critical. Uh, Mayor Coffin, you would also want to come in on this topic. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you for conferences like this, because it's very important um, to think global and act local. And let me add, um, think global with partners and act local with partners, with companies and the citizens. And after all, um, I think another issue is very important too, to bring people together as a mayor, as a CAO, it doesn't matter. It's um, important to be nice but it's nice it's nice to be important but it's important to be nice this makes something easier to deal with the people the companies and to reach the common targets thank you very wise words important to be nice huh yeah chin tan i'm going to be nice to you and you're going to help us close off Maybe your closing thoughts, and we'll go down this way. Since I've always left Chintan to the end, now you're going to help us oh gosh, uh, kick I got this the first off. One. But yeah, to close <laughs> your closing thoughts on what do you think are the most um, kind of actionable advice that you would provide to the audience on how to connect, communicate, and collaborate to form enduring partnerships? Thank you. Um, I think I'll just reiterate what I'd mentioned in the start as well. Uh, that it's, it's very important for you city leaders to have a very, very clear vision, uh, and that's primary. That takes precedent over anything and everything that we do, and that's for all city leaders out here, uh, that that is really important, that if you have a clear vision that helps very easily to move things down to other aspects of the government or other aspects of your organization, etc., please always think about how that vision gets translated into actions and implementable actions. And then hence, you need to take all the other actors on that journey so that the, the implementers or the people who can turn your vision to reality are able to do that. In most cases that we've seen or I have seen in, in the work that I have done is that you sometimes have a very, very clear vision, but there is no way to translate it down to reality or the opposite happens. There is no clear vision and everyone is implementing whatever they want at the, ground, at the ground level. So that link is super important and I would strongly recommend for both sides of the party to work in partnership so that we can achieve a common thing. And that goes for new cities that we build and also, which is very, very important. How do you design new cities whilst not emitting carbon in the atmosphere? Super important challenge. And also for existing cities, when we're talking about decarbonization, not only of buildings, but every bit of ecosystem that exists, like trains, like waste, like all of those aspects that come together. Thank you, Chintan. Vice Chair, Mr. Wong, uh, what is your advice on how to connect, communicate, and collaborate with different stakeholders to form lasting partnerships?
tôi nghĩ rằng là trước hết là hai bên các đối tác với nhau là phải có cùng I think most importantly both sides as partners must have shared expectations and objectives if each side has their own wish with different directions I'm very certain that we cannot have a good partnership We must also have specific action plans. So after we identify the shared objectives and direction, we must have had that by memorandum or by project sharing, such as training or consultancy projects. Thirdly, we need to be responsible when we carry out these plans at each site. If we can achieve these goals, we become close friends in every point of time and every area and can achieve the goals for each local authority. Thank you, thank you, Vice Chair. Very useful to have shared vision and shared objectives. Amy, go ahead. I was laughing because I, I kind of have maybe the opposite perspective. Um, but while you're completely right as well, but I'm going to answer that. You have to have faith. You have to know that um, more people minds coming together is going to create better projects and better partnerships and show better examples and need to understand that communities are experts too. They have expertise that is lived expertise, which may also be very um, similar to the expertise that you might have from being a, a governor or a mayor or through other leadership. And when those two expertises come together, you really do create projects that are better and they're much easier to be implemented because it can go faster when everybody um, wants it to happen instead of fighting against it. Thank you, Amy. Mayor Coffin, your parting words of wisdom on how to build enduring partnerships. What's your advice? One piece of advice. Be, be open-minded and, and friendly and um, I think um, that's be, good advice. Be nice and authentic, I'm yes. hearing from you as well. Be nice and clear, and um, I think that's, that's, that's all. Thank you. Lucy? I may deviate from that and just give my concluding uh, comments. So we are a startup city, and uh, as you can imagine, there's huge amount of opportunity for partnership, and I would really like to invite every one of you to please come see we have a booth uh, port city booth and uh, and uh, yeah any partnership is much welcomed thank you thank you to see and uh, if i may just have a quick reflection uh, i think we heard a lot of very helpful perspectives on the importance of shared vision coming together and building trust and the trust whether it's taking the time to journey together as a partnership or working with more trusted in intermediaries that already have built a certain level of trust within the community. I think that's very helpful. And also the importance of authentic communication and wanting the genuine uh, desire to partner the community, the different stakeholders to develop the place and to work on common shared objectives. Well, join me together and thank the panel. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, speakers and moderator. We have come to the end of this track, but please do carry on the very interesting conversations off stage. Thank you, Yuning, for moderating such a rich and insightful session. And thank you to all our speakers for being so generous with your views. Now, may I please invite everyone on the panel to remain on stage for a quick group photo please to stand up and come forward just take a step forward take a group photo
นี้มาสเตรบีฟอร์คลอสซิ่งเดอะเซสชั่นวิลไลค์ทูกิฟเอ็ดเวิร์ดออฟทังส์ทูออลล์ออฟสปอนเซอร์ส์ออฟ WCS 2022 Thank you very much for your support for those who are attending the Lee Kuan Yew World City Prize Award Ceremony and Banquet this evening at the Istana please be reminded that prior RSVP and security clearance is necessary for the buy invite only event and you would have already received your confirmation via email there will be special shuttle buses Departing from the Sands Expo and Convention Center pickup drop-off point in front of the Expo halls at Level 1 from 5:30 onwards, buses depart every 10 minutes, and the last bus to depart will be at 6:30 p.m. You may exit the hall via the side exits. Finally, playbacks of this track session will be available in our virtual conference, which will start from 10th of August. Please scan the QR code on the screen for more information about the WCS 2022 virtual conference. Before you leave, we would appreciate also that if you could give us, take some time to fill in our feedback form via the QR code and link as shown. With that, thank you everyone. Keep safe and have a wonderful evening ahead. Thank you.